sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee, peace be still, in all of life's ebb and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. My life was wrecked by sin and strife. This could fill my heart with pain. Jesus swept across the broken spring, stirred my slumbering chords again. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. the fifth. Soon he's coming back to welcome me, far beyond the starry sky. I shall wake my flight to worlds unknown. I shall reign with him on high. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my Let's bow together for prayer. Lord, we do thank you for Jesus. Thank you for our gift of salvation. Thank you for your sacrifice. Lord, we thank you for your blessings. Lord, we do pray that uh, you would meet with us tonight, Lord. You bless the time we have in your house. I do thank you for all these that are here tonight, Lord, and I pray that you would just uh, take control of the service. Lord, you do what only you can. Lord, uh, your Holy Spirit move amongst us and stir our hearts as we look into your word and worship you. So, Lord, now, we, again, we just thank you for our pastor. Pray you bless him as he preaches. Thank you for these folks. Pray you bless them. Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, brother. Go ahead and do announcements at this time. Amen. <coughs> All right. Uh, again, this uh, Sunday, Saturday, the 28th, is the teen activity. And that's all those that are in that class. I believe it starts at age 11. And so that's from 3 to 6 here at the church. They're going to have a good time. They're going to eat and play and cut up. And you know what how they do. They have a good time. So y'all pray they'll have a good time together, fellowship in there. And uh, next Sunday is the 29th. It's the fifth Sunday singing. Um, wanted to bring a little clarity to the, um, the, the event in the square there. So it is 5.30 to uh, 7.30. It's in... And we have the uh, McFathers have volunteered to take the table over there for us. Uh, so we were able to fill that, that void of getting the table there early. Uh, and then we'll all be there. Whoever's able to be there, uh, handing out candy, smiling, you know, praising the Lord, whatever. You know, just being a good face to the community and uh, giving out tracts and information about the church and things of that nature. With that being said, I didn't want to... Um, I didn't want to get in the way of the fifth Sunday night singing as far as taking any time away from that. So what I would like, if you're able, next Sunday night, if we are able to get here at 5.15 before the singing at, at 6 o'clock, we can pack, have a little packing party, we call it, you know, to pack, put the candy in the goodie bags um, with the tracks. The tracks are actually already in there. We just got to fill the candy and put little ties on them. And so... Um, so if you're able to be here about 5.15 next week just to volunteer, we're going to have a little time just set aside to uh, put those things together, and that way we can have our, su our Sunday singing right after that and not take away time uh, from that. So if you would, that would be wonderful. And then don't forget, the clock's falling back on the 5th and our uh, Soup and Chili Fellowship on the 19th. Midweek service, the week of Thanksgiving, is on Tuesday, not Wednesday. Plan on that being a praise service. Uh, we, you know, have a have a special time of, of sharing praises and and thanks to the Lord that week, and then of course the kids on uh, on the tenth of December, the uh, adult singing on the seventeenth, and then the uh, No Christmas E P M service. We'll have morning service for sure, and have a special um, special time worshiping the Lord on Christmas Eve, but just no evening service on the twenty fourth. All right, I believe that's all. That's uh, a couple folks had asked about. Um, uh, Brother Tenney 
And Miss Tenney, uh, every year, once a year, he goes up to the church where he first got started in ministry up there in Morrow and leads the singing for them and sings specials for them. And they have a big day up there, uh, kind of like a homecoming service. And uh, that's where they are up there in this church where he first got started in the ministry and, and when he first uh, got saved and surrendered to preach and that kind of thing as a youth minister. Uh, so they're, they're well and healthy, no issues there. And uh, we're, we'll pray for Brother Mark should be on his way back now uh, from taking care of his mom this weekend in Alabama. All right, brother. All right. Remain seated. 246 higher ground. 246. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. By faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay. Where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. By faith on heaven's stable land, a higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. On the last. I want to scale the utmost high and catch a gleam of glory bright. Stood through my pray till heaven I found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. My faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher all right, if you'll flip over to 249. Good song there. I'd... <coughs> Heaven came down, 249. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day. Day I will never forget. After I wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend. He met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling. He made all my darkness depart. Heaven came down. family divine, justified fully through Calvary's love, oh what a standing is mine, and the transaction so quickly was made, when as a sinner I came, took the offer of grace he did proffer, he saved me, oh praise his dear name, amen. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Sublime. 
is because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believe. Rich is eternal and blessed supernal from his precious hands I receive. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior If you would stand, please, on our last song, and then I'll get out of the way and let Pastor come. 185. 185, Rock of Ages. <coughs> Rock of Ages, clap for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the Man, Amanda was on schedule to sing tonight, but she don't have a voice, so that's okay. I just kicked her off the schedule. No, I'm just kidding. Um, let's see if we can fire this thing up real quick. All righty. Well... So, we're going to do it a little different tonight, and uh, it's been a long time since we've done this. I kind of, when I got back from Israel, we did the Israel series, and I didn't finish. I brought us all the way up to the day uh, when we were entering into Jerusalem, and I kind of stopped there, and we spent the last three days there in that area and surrounding areas. And um, this morning, because of the message I was reminded of a couple of things. So I'm going to show you a couple of things, and then I'm going to preach. Kind of do it in reverse. Um, and uh, so we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 4 tonight. Um, but I wanted to just show you a couple of things. Joshua, if you would get this one up here. Or you can get them all, I guess, for this part of it. Um, can you all see that okay? This was the craziest thing. I'm standing at Shiloh, and Shiloh was a newly excavated site. There was, uh, there's a lot of sites in Israel that they've been digging for 50, 60, 70 years. Shiloh is one of the newer um, locations, and they're still, they're still kind of finding things and searching. So they didn't have a big, um, you know, a, a big place. But in this little uh, excavation site, they had a little bitty gift shop and this little bitty hut. So we go into this little hut, and there's this kind of... 3D model surrounded by glass and we circle around this thing and they say everybody circle around and I took a video now it's a little grainy because I'm holding my phone like this in the dark this is the neatest thing it's not a television it's what they call a hologram I think <laughs> but I want to share this with everybody there <laughs> Back up. 
back at the foot of Mount Sinai, we were commanded for the first time to build a tabernacle. And in fact, after the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai, the tabernacle was built. The tabernacle is a portable temporary temple. But for 39 years, it accompanied us in our wanderings through the desert, taken apart and reassembled again and again. After entering the Holy Land, Joshua established the tabernacle in Shiloh. The Shiloh tabernacle is built of a stone foundation and wooden beams and covered by layers of fabric a combination symbolizing the transition from a temporary tabernacle to a more permanent one. Shiloh is to be the dwelling place of the Shekhinah, the divine presence, the holiest site for the Jewish people for 369 years. The tabernacle was comprised of two main parts, the courtyard and the tabernacle tent. The tabernacle courtyard was rectangular, 100 cubits in length, by 50 cubits in width, about 50 meters by 25 meters. In the heart of the courtyard stood the altar, made of wood overlaid with copper. On it burned the eternal fire, on which sacrifices, meal offerings, and wine offerings were made every single day. Since it is forbidden to ascend the altar by stairs, the Kohanim, the priests, ascended by a ramp. Before the Kohanim begin the tabernacle service, they would purify their hands and feet in the copper laving basin which stood between the altar and the tabernacle tent. It is said that when the contributions for the tabernacle were collected in the desert, all the women donated their copper mirrors from which the laving basin was made. First thing in the morning, the Kohanim entered the tabernacle tent the sanctuary for the day's service. Twice a day, they burned incense on the gold-plated incense altar. A blend of 11 special spices, which were placed on the coals, and whose wonderful perfume wafted far into the distance. Once a week, Special loaves of bread were placed on the golden table, which stood at the north end of the sanctuary. The secret method of preparing the showbread was passed down from father to son. Every evening, the candles of the seven-branched menorah, which stood in the south across from the table, were kindled. The menorah was made of a single piece of solid gold and ornamented with flower-like cups, buds, and blossoms. At the tip of every branch was a receptacle into which pure olive oil was poured. Ever since, the menorah has been one of the symbols of the Jewish nation. Only once a year, on Yom Kippur, the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, entered the Holy of Holies. In the Holy of Holies stood the Ark of the Covenant, on top of which were the curtain and the two cherubs. The cherubs were in the form of two angels facing each other with wings outstretched over the ark. Inside the ark were the tablets of the covenant, the first tablets, which were broken by Moses, and the second, unbroken tablets. The tablets and the broken tablets lie inside the ark. This is the place from which God's voice is heard. And I will speak to you from above the Ark Cover, between the two cherubs, which are above the Ark of the Covenant. The tabernacle is a place of meeting, where man meets himself, where man meets his brothers and his people, where man meets his Creator. There is much more to it than meets the eye. The clues and secrets hidden in every part of the tabernacle and its vessels are many. Lofty. For 369 years, the tabernacle dwelt in Shiloh until the city was destroyed by the Philistines. It then wandered until Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem. But to this
this very day, it is said, if you stand where the tabernacle stood and take a deep, deep breath, you can smell, if only for a moment, the scent of the incense, which still suffuses the walls. So you saw, you heard me, uh, I'm not done, Joshua. You heard me reference a few things in there this morning. So I'm doing this for reference purposes. They weren't a classic nation in the way that we think of it because they were 12 conglomerate tribes, and yet they were one people and one nation. And they had a central civil government of sorts, but it was concurrent with the place where the tabernacle was. Why? Because their law was the Torah. Ceremonial, civil, that's, I mean, that's, that's how they did everything. Their moral law, everything was found there. And so the seat of operation, so to speak, the administration, was here where the tabernacle is. Okay, so it's an important place. Why there? Why right here? Why at Shiloh? Well, there's any number of reasons, but one of them might be, anybody know which tribal allotment we're in, in this area right here? Ephraim, okay, who was from Ephraim? Ephraim, I should say. Who was from Ephraim? Joshua, right? Joshua, the son of Nun, was from the tribe of Ephraim. So maybe he said, it's my house, it's my place. Let's have it here. We don't know exactly for sure. There are some indications archaeologically that we could find, but nothing to point us to a motive. And yet what we find here is a place that for 300 years was the central government and central religious worship place in Israel. Now, you're, you've already been in Jerusalem. You haven't been down into the old city yet, right? Right. Okay, you're going to go into the old city. Last night I was down there. I took some video. It was crowded, packed with Orthodox worshipers down there singing and shaking and moving. And you've seen this done. And just crowds of them down there. Why? Because... At the Western Wall is the closest they can come to the place where the presence of God dwelt, or the way that God says it in the Scriptures is where His name dwelt. Now, in Jeremiah 7, 12, he says, Go now to Shiloh and see the place where my name dwelt first. This is where he put it first. So for 300 years, over 300 years, the Mishnah says 369, I think it's more about 310, 315 years, the Ark of God dwelt at this place. Now, where? That's what we said. Maybe it's here. Maybe it was here. There's a site out on the end of the tail that we're going to see. It, maybe it's there. But uh, this is that place. This is the area. Let's keep going. We're going to get out to the very end of the tail. Then let's sit down for just a minute. I spent the, the entire trip Bible study all day, every day. Everywhere we went, there was a lesson to be had. There was a message to hear. Uh, it, it was a pure education, but we're walking Shiloh, and really, to be honest with you, even as a pastor, other than just reading it, I, I didn't really understand the significance of Shiloh and the, the deepness of Shiloh there. And uh, and this this guy talking is not the pastor that we went with that led us. This was one. He's actually from Georgia. You can tell by the accent. But he goes over there and does excavations. He'll spend a week or two. And he'll help dig, and then he'll every year he'll he makes it a point to go excavate. So he had specific knowledge of digging it up in Shiloh. There's one. I'm gonna turn over just one more picture. There we go. Then we're gonna move back over there. It's gonna be a little crazy, and then we're gonna move up to the front of the city. I'll try to time it out right with that group right there to make sure we don't run in each other. And uh, I've prayed much for this day, so I, I believe the Lord's helping us out a lot. I really do. First Samuel 3, the Bible says, The child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. You know this situation. You know Hannah has come to this place. Elkanah, her husband, um, she has wanted a child. She gets a child. Of course, she prays for that child here. Here at Shiloh, she prays for that child. Eli says, What are you drunk? It's the middle of the day. She says, I'm not drunk. I'm praying. This is my heart's cry. And he says, the Lord's going to give you a request. And she brings that child, and he's raised here, here in this area. Mm -hmm. As I look back over there, this is the, that's the view I was talking about between those two hills where you see the sun come up as you come out here onto the tail. Now, to bring it back to the history a little bit, and I don't want to mix the history and the Bible too much as far as the impact the site makes, but the, the working hypothesis among the, is, the Israelis, among the antiquities authorities, is that the tabernacle would have set furthest out here on the north end of the tail. There's been more excavations right here. To be honest, there's not a lot of evidence to say that the tabernacle rested here. Though again, one more working hypothesis. But one thing that's been discovered in the last few years, and this is really cool, this is something I get to say, 
four years ago, sorry, yes, four years ago when I was out here, my first time ever digging, it really wasn't the most exciting week. My first week I was getting to know things and beginning to learn. And the last two days they said, you know what? You can bring your square out a little bit, work down. Let's just do some scouting down into the soil. We're going to open up some squares to work next year. And I came across something. They said, stop, we're going to work that next year. And it was a wall, okay? It was obviously a wall that was coming out this way. So it was oriented north to south. They said, kind of stop. We might, we might have found something there we're looking for. We'll come to find out. It was the, it was the gate of the city in the Canaanite period. I got, to, I got to put eyes on that. Really one of the first. Me and a guy named Jeremy awesome. Goldstein got to see that first maybe in 3,000 years since somebody had seen that. So that's a pretty cool thing. You're going to see that in just a moment, okay? But that told us something that we, we really already knew, which was that the tabernacle would have been located outside of the city walls. Well, why would you put the tabernacle, the most precious holy site outside the city walls? You know what it's going to do, right? You're going to destroy it. Okay, number two, not only is it vulnerable, well, we just made the walk down. Now make the walk back up. Every time you have a daily sacrifice, now take all the bones of the animals back over there because that, we've understood, is what they call a favisa. Okay, like for a visa. Okay, a favisa, which is a bone deposit. Where they, put the, where they put the bones. Now, all the bones found over there is predominantly the right side of the animal. Why the right side of the animal? That pertained to the priest. Remember Hophni and Phinehas. They're, of course, abusing their privilege, and they're getting the best cuts. They're not honoring the Lord. The Lord deals with Eli because of that. There's another reminder of what's taking place at this site 300 years into its history here. Well, why would you go from here all the way around the tell every day, every day, back and forth around the city, around the city walls, to deposit those doesn't make a lot of sense does it but we found not only a predominance of the right side of the animal but almost no pig bone again another indication that we are at a site that is jewish okay now in a moment i'm going to walk up we're going to go back up here i want you to see the gate of the city get an orientation of how the, 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 the city looked but before we do that just over here you came by a big structure that structure is a wet sifting station. It's a major improvement in archaeological technology. It's made a huge impact. <clears throat> Write this down. You're going to Google this in a little while. I'm not going to get into it. Mount Ebal Curse Tablet. Just, just, just Google it later, okay? And then four hours later, when you come out of the zone that you've been digging into that, uh, the same archaeologist you find at Mount Ebal Curse Tablet is the same one that we work with here at this site. Over there is the wet sifting station. Everything that comes through here goes through that wet sifting station. It's the most precise sifting of all the finds, the artifacts that come out of here. I want us to go over there because I want us to take a walk by this, the, the, the souvenir shop, okay? There's a souvenir shop right over there, okay? You don't need any money. It's pottery, okay? And you're, it's, the, it's the junk pile. It's not for me because that's a treasure, right? But all of that's been read, processed, whatever's been necessary has been kept, whatever isn't is, is thrown aside so you can go out there and you can actually take a little bit of pottery home with you. That could be anywhere from 35, 3,600 year old Canaanite pottery that I was excavating this past summer all the way up to maybe even the Roman period. More likely because of the timing of the dig, you're going to be getting into the Canaanite pottery, which is again, 35, 3,600 years old, even some of the Israelite pottery from that period of time. So you can go by there. If you want to take a bucket full of it, just remember you got to pay the extra weight in your suitcase. They don't care. We're done with it. We're going to add more to it this summer, okay? So we're going to walk by there, and then I'm going to meet you right over here on this side of the tail. But this gives you... All right, so that was the guy who dug it up. The pottery that you have in your house, those of y'all that got a piece, that they're digging it up, dating it to the exact time, either Israelite or Canaanite pottery, uh, from the time that the tabernacle was at Shiloh, uh, which was also where he mentioned where Hannah's prayer, where she prayed, and the Lord gave her a son. And... Only one more to go, and we'll get back into the Bible. Tabernacle you don't find somewhere that you don't find throughout the Torah. Anytime you hear the word door, you're talking about a curtain, the curtain of the tabernacle. In 1 Samuel 3, the, the, the vision of the Lord is precious. There's no open vision in those days. Of course, the lamp of the Lord went out. And so the Lord speaks to Samuel. Well, Samuel delivers the brunt of the message. Eli says, give it to me straight, and he does. He, he delivers the, the, the message of judgment that's coming. And then it says the next day he went out and he opened the doors. That Hebrew word is dalet. I'm right. I'm not making it up, right? It's dalet. Okay, he opens the daltot or the, the doors of the house of the Lord. You don't read about that before. It's another clue that we have a permanent structure, okay? Because that's not, it's not, it's not a curtain now. It's a door. Now, if you 
Remember where we came by a little while ago, the favisa, the bone deposit. Now, instead of walking from there to there, now we realize that bone deposit's just right over the hill, about a 30 second walk, maybe a little bit less than that. Three or four years ago, as they began to dig down, you're gonna notice as you look behind you, they came across some walls that did not seem to be in the right place, or at least it was very interesting to them. They wanted to investigate what it was. And mind you, they were not looking for the tabernacle platform, just trying to understand the area, the era, and the period in which Joshua occupied and conquered the land, okay? But as they began to uncover this, they realized that they were coming across walls that were oriented east to west. Sun, sunrise, sunset. You go to the Jerusalem today, and you remember the way the, te the temple sat. It sat facing the east. We go up on the Mount of Olives, and we look at the eastern gate. That's the way it was oriented. Okay, so we've got an east to west monumental building. We've got a bone deposit down over the hill that is kosher, to use that term. It means there's no pig bone. It's to the right side of the animal. It's according to what the scriptures say. It's inside the city walls. And also within that, we've begun to find things like ceramic pomegranates. If you remember down around the the robes at the end of the robes of the high priest there were bells and pomegranates bell pomegranate bell pomegranate bell pomegranate you can find all the articles about that you'd like about the ceramic pomegranate found on this site just a little bit down and to my left behind you and to your right right there is where that was found there have been egyptian scarabs there have been coins all to date the periods and this and the structure correctly what this told us was that something from the the, the period of joshua the pottery dated the carbon dating dated and what we have here is an east to west ornamental building oriented correctly with a bone deposit, with the correct kind of bone deposit within the city walls of Shiloh. The Mishnah said it was on a, on a, on a permanent platform. And so if you look out there, you can even see where those sandbags are. You see a little raised up place. Now you're kind of seeing there's the dimensions. And if you overlay those dimensions, okay, with the dimensions of the tabernacle, it fits exactly. It's oriented exactly. It has the right kind of things. It's, it's set in the right place. It is not on the high place. It's not. God said, don't do that. It's not there. It's here at the right place, which tells me that from about, let me see here, right about black shirt right there. Lots of, no, sunglasses. Right about right where he is, up to about where Pastor John is right here. If you're standing in there, you're standing about in the holy place of the tabernacle of God. Which means that right behind you, right over there, and you can kind of see there's a, there's a wall that runs through that dates from the Roman era, but the gray shirt right here, green backpack from here, all the way down to the other green shirt, you got about essentially go out to that big wall that's facing you about 30 feet away from you, and that would have been the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of God dwelled for 300 years. Now again, we're interpreting we're wondering, do we have, is there a spot down there that says this is it? Did Eli sign it and say in 3,000 years you come and check me, this is where it was? No, we don't have that. Honestly, it doesn't, it, it's, it's not imperative that we know. The evidence speaks volumes. But I will say this. To stand right here and know that God said I placed my name here. It reminds me of the awe to stand in a place where God dwelt among his people. But I can't do that unless... I also remember that God dwells among his people here in this body of people. And that's why he says in Hebrews chapter four that we have access into the very holiest. And then he says, come boldly. Those stones say what? Don't come. Don't come. You're not allowed. There's a veil. It's you cannot come in here unless you're of the right family and the right person in the right family among the right nation at the right time of year but we can come boldly into the throne of God. We can find grace to help in time of need. This is the place where God did it, but it also tells me that the place was not of utmost importance to God. Because when we read Jeremiah chapter seven, he is warning his people through Jeremiah. If you continue in your ways and continue in your ways and say, hey, we've got the temple of the Lord. We must be special. Nothing can happen to us. And he says, go back to Shiloh. Go to Shiloh where I first placed my name there and see what I did to that place. I've magnified my word above all my name. My word will be honored. My word, and in this place, we're reminded that as awesome as it is to stand here at the Holy of Holies, in the holy place of the tabernacle of the Ark of God, yet we know that God does not dwell in temples made with hands.
but he has purchased for us a different dwelling altogether. Okay to sing? Yeah. And then I'm Amen. done. Yeah. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise. So uh, it just completely ties all, t all that, what we talked about this morning together where we were in Jeremiah chapter 7, where he said, go back. Now, you'll see, as they're digging it up, it's all still, it's just, it's just rubble. It's all rubble. There are places that I visited that they were able to find almost full structures underground. Um, and, but here, it's all rubble. The Lord told them to go back and see what happened when you get away from God. And where I was standing there is where the tabernacle originally was, and uh, and and they were reminded, but in First Samuel four, the title of the message is "Don't Force the Spirit of God." Don't force the Spirit of God. He referenced in the video chapter three of First Samuel, chapter five and six. We're in chapter four. The Bible says in verse 1, And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and pitched beside Ebenezer. And the Philistines pitched in Aphek. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. And when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines. And they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. And when the people were coming to camp, into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. So, they go to battle, they lose the first battle, the 4,000 here die, they're getting nervous, they're getting worried, and they have the idea that they go get the Ark of the Covenant, and they'll bring them back to the battlefield, bring it back to the battlefield, so that they can defeat the Philistines. They were essentially treating the Ark of the Covenant like a lucky rabbit's foot, if you will. They think, oh... Well, we'll just go, f and, and the, look at the language. It, it says, let us fetch the ark. Let's go grab it. Let's go get it. Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh. So the ark of the covenant was in the tabernacle in the Holy of Holies. It's in Shiloh. They're at battle, and, they, and they're going to bring uh, the, the ark of the covenant to battle. They're just thinking that's going to be all it takes. Does the Lord tell them to do that? Any time in Scripture... When you see the Israelites lose, most of the time it's because of their sin. But when they, when Lord allowed an enemy to defeat them, you would find the leaders get fall on their face, call out onto the Lord, ask the Lord for direction, rent their clothes. I remember when Joshua did it, uh, he, he rent his clothes, he's praying, Lord, in, in chapter 7, I believe, in Joshua, what, why, why, Lord, why? Uh, you told us to, to go to battle, why did we lose? And he says, get up off your feet and go figure it out, because Achan had sinned, right? The sin of Achan is what caused them to lose the battle. Uh, but they, the point was, is Joshua sought the Lord's face. But these guys get the idea, well, let's just go grab the Ark of the Covenant and take it back to battle, and we'll win. It's just that simple, right? It's just that simple. We'll just go, and essentially for us as Christians, let's just go take the Holy Spirit and throw it into every situation, and it's all, and we're going to rub our hands together, we're going to count to ten, and it's all going to be just perfect, right? No, that's not the way the heart of the Lord works. It's not a, it's not, the Holy Spirit is not to be used as some type of uh, lucky rabbit's foot that gets us out of trouble. Amen? See, the Lord, as I mentioned this morning talking about worship, the Lord is more concerned with us worshiping Him and spending time in communion with Him than He is trying to fix all of our issues and problems in this life. Some of our issues and problems will be fixed if we spend more time worshiping and communion with Him. 
But what happens is, is a lot of people treat the Lord like this, and I, forgive me for even saying this, like a genie in a bottle, so to speak. Can't think of a better term to use. Where I, I, I'm going to just run to the Lord whenever I have this issue and I need Him to fix, and I'm going to pray, Lord, I need your help. I need, I, I, and, and then the rest of the time, they're not spending time with the Lord, not reading their Bibles, not praying, not doing... And then something else will come up. Oh, let me run to the Lord and let me, let me, let me pray and try to get him to fix this issue. And then it, he takes care of it. And then we fall right back into what, the way we, we live. And so, so they're running. They grab the Ark of the Covenant. And it says in verse 4, So the people sent, uh, people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from thence the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubims. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, now he mentioned that in the video, they were misusing, uh, when they were had to bring sacrifices, they were taking all the good cuts of meat, you know, almost like taking the filet mignon and, and, and giving the leftovers, you know. Uh, they, they, were, they were not following the Lord properly. And it says, between the cherubims and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, uh, were there with the ark of the covenant of God. And when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout so that the earth rang again. So the Israelites are excited. They, they bring the ark of the covenant back and they, they yell out in, in, in excitement so loud that it says the earth shake. And, and um, I've actually, somebody was telling me at a football game at one of the colleges a few weeks ago, they actually registered on the Richter scale nearby because they were yelling so loud so it's possible it's it's, it's been scientifically proven uh, that 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 can take place and so that's what was taking place they were screaming and shouting with a with a happiness no doubt they were excited they were excited listen trying to do something and force something can sometimes bring temporary excitement so they're 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 trying to move the spirit of the lord and I've seen this in churches. I've seen the, you know, preachers running around and jumping over the pews and doing backflips and all. Like I saw a video one time. A guy jumps into the baptistry with his full of water. Like, really? But trying to, uh, and it can bring temporary excitement and get everybody shouting for a few minutes. But what does it do in the heart? What is it doing in our lives? How is that helping, right? And so, uh, so all this, they're excited, they're, they're screaming, hollering with excitement. And it said the earth rang again in verse 6. And when the Philip, uh, Philistines <clears throat> heard the noise of the shout, they said, What meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of, he, of the Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of the Lord come into camp. So they said, Oh, no, they done brought the ark. Verse 7. And the Philistines were afraid. For they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, Woe unto us, for there hath not been such a thing uh, hit or two before. Even the enemy knew that they were misusing. Now, they didn't, might not have understood they were misusing, but even the enemy knew that this was different. They recognized that this hasn't happened before, is what that verse means. They look at the situation, and they're going, we've never seen this one before. They done brought the ark right into the middle of this thing, and uh, this is different. Verse 8, Woe unto us, who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with the plagues in the wilderness. Be strong and quit yourselves like men, O ye Philistines, that ye be not servants unto the Hebrews, as they have been to you. Quit yourselves like men and fight. Now, this is interesting. The Lord is given the conversation, the, the heartbeat of the enemy right here. We are, we are seeing the heartbeat of the enemy. Who, did Samuel, was he standing with the Philistines? No. The Lord listens and can hear what the enemy's saying and allowed it to be put in his word in 1 Samuel. This is interesting. So the Lord, the Lord is, listen, the, the Lord knows all this, this craziness going on right now. The Lord knows what Hamas is doing. The Lord knows what Hezbollah is doing. The Lord knows what Russia is doing. The Lord knows what China is doing. He knows what North Korea is doing. He knows what our politicians are The Lord knows exactly what everybody's doing. And so he, we see the recording of what the Philistines are saying. 
against the Israelites. And he says, we're not going to be slaves to them. We're not going to fall in their hands, and we're not going to serve the Hebrews. So y'all better toughen up. Y'all better fight like men. You better, you, you know, you better uh, quit yourselves like men and fight, it says in verse 9. Let me say this. This is why it's so important. This is why it's so important to make sure we are following the Spirit of God and allowing the Spirit of God to lead us. Because when we try to force the Spirit of God... The enemy will be boldened, will embolden itself. Did you catch that? When we try to force the Spirit of God on a situation, the enemy will embolden itself to fight against us or strengthen itself. We need to be careful and make sure we're not trying to force the Spirit of God. So they bolden themselves, they quicken themselves. Verse 10, uh, and the Philistines fought. And, the Isra and Israel was smitten, and they fled every man into his tent, and there was a very great slaughter, for there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. Now, they first was, the first time it was 4,000 men. The second time it's 30,000. That's 34,000 Israelites killed. Now, I, I, I meant to say this again. I'll say this again. Listen, I support Israel 100%. Our country supports Israel. We're going to stay with Israel. Anybody ask you what you think about this war going on, we stand with Israel. There was, I think now they're talking, it's close to 2,000 of them just slaughtered, heads cut off, all that kind of stuff. Sad. But look at this. 34,000 died that day. Well, 30,000 that day. 30,000 died that day in that one battle. That's unbelievable. That is unbelievable. All because they tried to force or move the Spirit of God on their own. It's pretty strong, isn't it? Again, I'll say what I said this morning. I'm glad I live in the New Testament. Amen. I praise the Lord that I was born now. Listen, the Lord didn't cut them no slack. But he is... He is he is very long-suffering, isn't he, to us? He's very long-suffering to us. And so 30,000 of them die because they tried to force the Spirit of God, tried to move the Spirit of God on their own without God giving them that direction, out of the holy place. And the ark of God was taken. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. Well, God took care of them, bad actors, didn't he? He took care of them. And there ran a man of Benjamin out of the army and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes rent and with the earth upon his head. And when he came, lo, Eli sat upon the seat by the wayside watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told it, the city cried out. So what we have here is the last time recorded that we can find, the best I can study, best we can see, the last time the ark is in Shiloh. God intended to, for this thing to be built. It's there. It, 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 it's where they had the, the tabernacle. If you look over um, in chapter 5, it says in verse 1, the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it to, uh, from Ebenezer to Ashdod. There's a lot of moving around there. And then in chapter 6, it says, and the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. Seven months. It bounced around a little bit. They found out quickly, the Philistines found out real quickly, that they had no business with the Spirit of God because it, it, was, it was not... They're thinking, oh, we done got the prize. We done got the ark of the covenant. Yeah, it didn't work out for them because they didn't know the God of which the ark belonged to, right? They didn't... Uh, and, and, and that's, you know, listen, that's why... The world is never going to be comfortable with our Bibles. The world is never going to be comfortable with the Spirit of God moving. The world is never going to be comfortable around God's people because they don't understand the Spirit of God that dwells within us. They're uncomfortable. They're uncomfortable when people are praising the Lord. They're uncomfortable when we're, when we're shouting and praising and, and, and saying hallelujah. They're uncomfortable when we read our Bibles and pray. It just makes them uncomfortable. Because they don't understand the Spirit of God. It didn't work out. If you read chapter 5, it won't take you long. It's just 12 verses. You'll find that it, would just, it was just kind of, 
Uh, it didn't work out the way they thought it would. Joshua gets there, and, and they, they were able to get a hold of it. And it's brought from one place to another to another. But as far as we know, uh, that was the last time it was in Shiloh. And then in Jeremiah, after Joshua's dead, David is dead. You know, Solomon had built the temple. And here you have Jeremiah preaching to the Israelites, saying, y'all are falling, y'all are slipping, you're running, you're not obeying, you're not doing what you ought to be doing. And God tells them, that, like as I preached this morning in Jeremiah, God tells them, I want you to go back to Shiloh, and I want you to look at what happened there. Look at what happened there. So the point of this morning and tying it together to tonight is this. Every single one of us have chosen to sin time, or, time and again. We've made bad decisions. We've done things wrong. The beauty of it is when God says uh, to amend our ways as we preached this morning, we can all look back and say, okay, when I did that, there wasn't a good outcome. And so maybe through prayer and following the Spirit of God and letting God lead, I don't have to go down that road again. When they go back to Shiloh, the point was to see the rubble, see the destruction, and realize how the Spirit of God was taken from them and, and how the, the, the tabernacle was never... Uh, the, the Scripture doesn't record who and why. It's no doubt was probably that those same Philistines probably destroyed it all, but there's no, there's no record of it. But other in Psalms and here in Jeremiah, it was destroyed because they did not follow God and tried to move the Spirit of God on their own. So it's a call for us to not try to force the Lord in a situation, but don't run from the Lord and live in the world. Let the Lord lead us each and every day so that we don't end up like this continual cycle of the Israelites. And it got to the point in Jeremiah that we preached this morning, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these where they cared more about the building than they cared about the God of the building. Are we still connected, brother? Let's see what time I got. I'm gonna, if if this will work, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you one last thing and we'll be done for the night. The same day I'm going into Israel, we got, we're in Shiloh, we're in the Mount of Olives, we're in Jerusalem, we're going... We're going uh, all through that area, I'm getting to see the temple walls, the southern steps, all that good stuff. And I'm, I'll show you that another time. But I want you to see this video right here. Broke my heart. <coughs> oh, is it not connected, brother? I don't know what's going on here. Interesting. It won't let me. Well, this is one I really wanted to show y'all. This, uh, of course, technology. Yeah. Well, I apologize. I'll, I'll have to figure that out. But as we close in prayer, what it is is. And you can, I can, I can show you separately if I need to. Um, what it is is the Wailing Wall. I walked up to the Wailing Wall and I and I prayed. I'm standing beside these Jews. Just like I said this morning, they're they're doing the whole thing. They're they're in the motion. They're doing all this and trying to get closer to the Holy of Holies as they can, not knowing that it's available to everybody. Come boldly, as the preacher said. I put my hand on the base of that wall and I'm praying that all those people around me will get the conviction of the Holy Spirit and get saved. It was a powerful moment. And uh, not that there was any power in the wall because I totally understood there wasn't any power in the wall. But I prayed for them to get saved. That the nation of Israel would realize who the Savior is. Then I walk into, they have kind of a covered thing in the building where it, it's like an inner court, kind of deeper part of the wall, kind of underground. And it gets it gets heated, it gets heavy in there, and it's you could feel 
you could feel the heaviness of a bunch of people seeking God but not understanding the God that they're seeking. And it broke my heart. There are people out there today seeking, but they don't know what they're seeking. And it's our job to explain to them and show them in the Bible, show them through our testimony what they're seeking. And that's a Savior named Jesus Christ. And on the 31st, we'll do that in the square of Forsyth. Let's have a stand. We'll stand together and close in a word of prayer. Brother Logan, if you would, closes in prayer. There are um, a couple folks sick, uh, the Kennedy uh, kids and Miss Debbie. I heard Jacob, had. they came back from their vacation and had a uh, high fever and not sure exactly what's causing it. Oh, that's what it is. So little Jacob has got COVID. So uh, let's pray for them. Uh, you know, it, he's little still. And uh, so let's pray. And um, pray for the whole family now that we know what it is for sure. That they, it'll, it'll be light on them too. All right, brother. Let's pray Lord, for them. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the message that you put on Brother Josh's heart to share with us tonight, Lord. Lord, we pray that you'll be with little Jacob and his parents as, when, they're go, when they're going through the COVID war be with Sister Debbie and, and Drew and Hannah as they're not feeling well, Lord. Be with Miss Amanda as she's sick and him and Miguel still getting over her sickness, Lord. Lord, I just thank you, Lord, for giving us your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and washed away our sins in his blood. Yes. Lord, we just love you so much, and it doesn't matter how many times or how often we say we thank you and we love you, Lord. It'll never be enough. Lord, we ask and pray, Lord, that you will continue to be with Israel, Lord, and protect them, Lord, and be with the United States and all the other countries, Lord, that they'll stop doing all the wrong things, Lord, and start looking towards you for the right answers, Lord. Lord, be with us as we go out this week, Lord, and guide us and protect us, Lord, and give us the spiritual strength and the spiritual knowledge and spiritual understanding that we need, Lord, to be able to witness to people so we can try to say, get, lead as many people as we can to you. Lord, before you yes. come back again, Lord, we just thank you and we love you in your Son Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.